Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's um, AMA Boston presentation, Applicant Tracking, the Impact that AI is Having on Hiring and Recruiting. My name is uh, Jim Panagas, and I'm going to be moderating today's discussion. Uh, the presentation will last for exactly one hour. We know you have places to go, so we'll be off the air by 7 p.m. We're going to be joined by three subject matter experts, whom I'll introduce in a few moments. Audience microphones are automatically muted so that we can keep a nice um, controlled discussion going. Although during the final 20 minutes, we've reserved that for questions and answers. So please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen and submit any questions you have at any time. And we'll get to those during the last 20 minutes of the program. You can also tweet with your colleagues uh, during the broadcast using hashtag AMA Boston. So let's start out with a, a definition of terms. You know, what is an applicant tracking system? And the definition is a software application that enables the electronic handling of recruitment and hiring needs. It's very similar to customer relationship management, but designed for recruitment tracking purposes. In many cases, it filters applications based on given criteria, such as keywords, skills, former employers, years of experience in schools attended. And this has caused many people to adapt their resume optimization techniques, which is uh, part of what we'll talk about today. So what do these systems actually do for us? Well, they organize the recruiting and hiring process through a single dashboard. They manage job postings and job applications. They track the progress of each candidate. We, they're used to schedule interviews, to send automated email replies, to handle the onboarding of new employees, and a lot more. This list is growing in leaps and bounds in, with this technology. How widely used are applicant tracking systems? Well. ATS software makers run the gamut from small business solutions all the way up to software that's suitable for Fortune 500 corporations. There are literally hundreds of these solutions on the market today. And you can see from some of these logos here that some major players have gotten into this market, including IBM and SAP. What does the market look like? Uh, in a word, it's crowded. It's a very fragmented market at the moment. Lots and lots of players. No player so far has grabbed more than 20% of the market. So this is a uh, certainly a changing uh, dimension, probably see some consolidations over time. And we thought you might like just a quick look, what does an application tracking system actually look like on the screen? So here's a, a typical screenshot and you can see it's tracking the number of people who have applied for a position, how many have been phone screened, how many have been assessed, how many have been interviewed internally already. It gives you a lot of information at a quick glance. Here, as you zoom in, you can uh, zoom in and look at a particular employee and see how are they doing in the process? How far along have they gone? Uh, any standout candidates that uh, your internal team has flagged so far, uh, excuse me, so far. <clears throat> and finally, uh, this is another capability that's rapidly coming into these systems and that is video and uh, essay questions. Those are being added to applicant tracking systems all the time. So it's a much more, a, a much lengthier process a lot more information is being asked of candidates um, as they're applying for these positions today. So before we get into uh, more and meet our panel, I want to take a quick break and introduce Megan McGrath. She's the president of AMA Boston. And Megan, I know you're out there and you want to tell the audience a little bit more about the organization. Thanks, Jim, and welcome everyone. We're really excited to have you all here tonight for a robust discussion, and I think uh, we'll all learn a lot. Eager to have these panelists kick things off, and uh, please feel free to add your questions into the chat throughout. Also, you'll notice some of us are introducing ourselves, connecting on LinkedIn. Feel free to do that as well. Um, I've left my LinkedIn in there if you want to chat about getting more involved with AMA Boston or maybe how I could support your career. Happy to do so for sure. You'll see on the screen in front of you really quickly our brand new website. So it's easier to engage with us um, than it's ever been before. Uh, please feel free to check it out. Send us some feedback. Um, we have volunteer positions open if folks are looking to get new skills or give back to the community. Um, and this is a little snap of our 2021 board of directors. Feel free to reach out to any of these folks. I know a lot of them have introduced themselves in the chat tonight. Um, and we will uh, stick around at the end to tell you about some upcoming events um, that we have in March that you can join in if you'd like to. All right, Jim, back over to you. Great, thanks, Meg. So time to meet today's panel. Um, let's start with Mary Truslow. She's the Managing Director of Communications Collaborative, a leader in marketing and creative recruiting. Zoe Morin is Vice President of Product Marketing with Workable, makers of a talent acquisition software that uh, team find, helps teams find candidates, evaluate applicants, and make the, the right hire faster. And finally, Matt Liptak is Director of Global Talent Acquisition for Aura, 
makers of device and data protection at home and beyond. So welcome panelists. We're glad to have you here. This is our panel of experts. So we have a lot of, a lot of you know, inside knowledge um, going into this. Um, and my screen is stuck, there we go. So we're gonna get right into some questions for the panel. Um, what do people need to know about applicant tracking systems in the year 2021? They've come a long way, they're going a long way. Um, Zoe, I know your company makes this technology. What do, you, what do you think? What do they need to know? Just kind of upfront. Yeah, I think a couple things. Um, whether you're a company that's trying to implement this technology for the first time, or you're a job seeker who's thinking, how is this going to impact my ability to find a, find a job in this market? Um, to me, I think the important thing to know about ATS is, is it's no longer project management software. Um, I think in the past, there was this uh, perception that you sort of this is a, a place, a repository for resumes. It's where resumes go to die. We lose them in there. You lose track of them in the system. Um, it's not like that anymore. It's evolved. It's more flexible. It's more agile. Um, I think it's, it's really about helping people hire better. Um, the other thing I would say is five, 10 years ago, I don't think you would have said, oh, a good ATS should, should help you deliver a great candidate experience. We were always thinking about features for the HR team, for talent acquisition, for recruiters. That's not the case anymore. Um, I think in order to be a good ATS in the in the space, you have to be able to create a compelling candidate experience. Um, so that's the other thing. I mean, I, I think that's where the future of some of this ATS technology is is headed. Awesome, Matt. What do you think? I would say, Jim, that uh, when I'm evaluating an ATS. Uh, to implement at some of the companies I've worked, uh, as Zoe had mentioned, the candidate experience is going to be paramount in today's market and mm -hmm. going forward. And the simpler, the better the application process. I think that the days of filling out pages and pages of applications and uh, frustrations around the application process, that's where I believe the applicant tracking system is headed. And you'll see that on a lot of the career pages and the front, the front pages of these applicant systems, it is becoming more of a simpler process where resumes are being scraped, data is being fed into the applicant system, and it's less and less tedious for the job seeker. So I do see that uh, going in that direction, as well as many features on the back end. But as far as the front end, the candidate experience is paramount. Mary, what about your view from Communications Collaborative? Well, I would say the the piece that we work with people on is the job seeker and talking with them about how to work with an ATS because we're often hearing about the frustrations rather than how best to partner with one. Um, the, the one that we use internally is definitely more of a database um, rather than a an applicant experience because we create that experience. So it's really about being sure that, that, and I know we'll get into this more, but knowing what the job is and what you're applying for and being sure that you're using the right words so that you're working with the ATS so that the ATS can maximize you and put you to the top of the list. Interesting, very good. Let's move on to uh, another question. What impact is ATS technology having on the recruiting and hiring process today? And you know, the ones that come to mind are making us more productive, allowing us to look at more candidates, leading us to the most qualified applicants. What are your thoughts on uh, these and other ideas you might have? Why don't we start with uh, Matt this time around? So, the, you know, this is a good question. Um, I think that on the back end for the recruiters, uh, viewing candidates and seeing the candidates come through the portals, the ATSs have gotten better and better. And there's been an improved process to be able to uh, streamline the efforts of the recruiter to see all the candidates presented in a style that's easy on the eye. They can go through each resume quickly. They can get through a good volume of candidates in a short amount of time. And they can move the candidates through the disposition process uh, with the hiring managers easily and more, more effectively. And I think that the systems are getting uh, quicker and there have been more streamlined processes implemented into these systems that have made it easier for the recruiters to work with the system. I think in the past, as Zoe was mentioning, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, these systems were 
more, just m not much more than a database. Mm -hmm. uh, and just to store your candidates and for the view of the recruiter, not so much the hiring manager and moving through the disposition process. So I think it's gotten a lot better. Than that. Cool. Mary? Well, again, it, it, we're sort of outside of an ETS and that we supplement them and companies come to us looking for something specific. So when we get to an ATS on um, a client side, when we're working with the hiring company, we're trying to match the best people up against a job. So our, our interaction, it, it may be more productive. Um, I think it's helping our HR partners move through the system um, a lot more quickly where they then put candidates forward to hiring managers rather than, um, you know, they sort through them and decide which ones to put forward. And then we'll get notification back as to where people are within the process. Interesting. So still, still a very human side to the recruitment process, even with all this technology. Very much so. Interesting. Much so. Zoe? Yeah, I think the... Um, where ATSs are now, I think that that productivity piece is key, right? And that's where everyone's focused. I, I think where technology is sort of headed though, I think that the ATS can have an even bigger impact on things like finding qualified candidates or finding candidates outside of traditional recruitment channels. So, I mean, to Mary's point, it's always gonna be, you have multiple tools in the toolkit, right? And so it's gotta be a balance between the human side of, of recruiting and then where some of this technology can help. but. You know, I think what's interesting, especially with AI in particular, is can we cast a wider net and find candidates that we wouldn't have otherwise found if we're using AI to actually go and grab uh, candidates that match the job description that you posted? Um, and, and I think that's where the technology is, is going to head to. I think where it's been effective so far and been improving so far is really in, in making, you know, recruiters better at their jobs, streamlining that process on the back end. But I think it has the potential to, to also really impact that, that sourcing piece as well. Just a side question that occurred to me, um, because of the technology, this underlying technology, do you feel that we're going through more candidates today than we were say five years ago, 10 years ago? And I'll, I'll throw that over to anybody who wants to answer that. Um, I, I think it depends on the position. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when you see how many people have applied to a position, um, it isn't always an indication that they're qualified. Um, some of it may be the type of position and, you know, in, in the experience that we see, there are certain positions everybody wants. Um, and then there are others, someone came to us today, they've had a position out for two weeks and they've gotten 18 applications. Wow. That is extremely low to me. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it depends on the role. I think it depends on how it's um, advertised and how the job description is written. What about on, on the flip side of that? I, I've seen job postings where all of a sudden it says like 702 applicants. Uh, is it even worth applying <laughs> at that point? I, I think it is because really? if, if it, well, if you think you're a qualified candidate, you have no idea who the other candidates are. True. So I think that's where some of the, this technology can help make a more efficient screening process too, because right, like whether you're the first person or the 700 and second person <laughs> to apply, uh, you might be just as qualified. So you, you know, the technology to help you identify those qualified candidates quickly is so critical. That's mm -hmm. what I think that's where things like video interviews, assessments, like some of the stuff that's starting to come out more and more, I think that's where you can you can apply that. And it's not right for every role, but for uh, for certain roles, especially those with the high inbound candidate volume, um, I think those tools can be particularly effective. And with one more kind of side question here, with this technology available to us that uh, is, is growing in leaps and bounds, um, are we taking longer to recruit candidates? You know, so we we're looking through more candidates over a little bit longer period of time. Is it, is it broadening the window is kind of what I'm getting at. I, I think it depends on the period of time. Um, and I think it depends on, is there pain in hiring or through the process are, is the hiring team determining what it is they need? Um, it isn't always, hey, we've got the job description and this is who we want. Sometimes through the process, it evolves as they start seeing candidates and reassessing. 
we may not need this particular skill or qualification that we thought we needed. And that may change the path of the hiring. So, I mean, I don't know about on the ATS side as to how that may affect the process because um, there, there are parts to the hiring that just, you know, if the pain isn't there and the desire to hire, it's just gonna take longer. The thing I found interesting, I'm sorry, Matt, were you gonna say something? I was gonna say that um, what you're going to see from internal t talent acquisition teams and recruiting teams is more of the model of, they're putting more of, of the sourcer, they're calling it, the person that is actually going out there and hunting for the person uh, than the traditional recruiter. So there's going to be the split nowadays where you'll see three or four sourcers on talent teams, and then you'll see the actual full life cycle recruiters. And the sourcers are there just to hunt for these candidates outside the applicant tracking system on, on portals like LinkedIn and so forth. And less dependency so much on the applicant tracking system to bring in the most qualified candidate. Now, that's not to say that the most qualified candidate is not going to be in that pool. Mm. That does apply. But typically, the model now is going out and hunting for the candidates that are actively not searching. They're passively. They're passive. Yeah. yeah they're the passive candidates. Those are the prime candidates that right. most companies want to go after. So the passive candidate is already employed someplace else. Is that what you mean? Exactly right. Ah, very interesting. Yeah. All right, let's move on to uh, another question. So uh, ATS systems are increasingly featuring video and essay questions, as I mentioned earlier, and allows it really allows companies and agencies to get to see and hear candidates before you've ever met them. You know, which is kind of accentuated through this pandemic process, which is you know everybody's doing Zoom. So good thing, bad thing. Are we going to see more of this in the future? Uh, the thing that I think about is, you know, what if candidates aren't crazy about writing essays or being on camera? I've seen terrific candidates that are just not good on camera, for example. Um, and if, uh, is the lot is the in-person interview uh, going away or, or or being lessened? You know, in this environment, what do, what do you guys well, think? I would think with Zoom right now, it's leading into video. Um, just, I mean, we've hired people that we haven't met in person just because of the pandemic. Um, I think Zoe, you've had the same experience, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. so yeah. the reality of video as part of the hiring process isn't as foreign as it may have been a year or two ago. And um, yes, it's a new technique, um, but it's understandable why it is a tool in the toolkit for hiring. Zoe, I think you mentioned earlier that uh, you've, you've had maybe 100 people hired since you joined the company that you've never met in person, only seen on Zoom, <laughs> right? So I'm, I'm just yeah. curious, what, what's that experience going to be like when you finally go back into an environment and actually meet these people face-to-face? -face? Well, you know, what's interesting is I think, I don't think we're ever really going to go back to normal. I think for a lot of organizations, it's going to be a hybrid. Um, we've gotten used to this, the flexibility. I think employers are going to have to provide that flexibility to candidates moving forward. So I think we could very well be in a world where you're hiring people remotely and you might not meet them for six months <laughs> until That's you both weird. happen to be in the office, right? At, at some point. I do think video is a necessity right now, given um, given the pandemic and the fact that most people are, are remote. Uh, I do think moving forward, you know, video is going to be right for some roles and not right for others. I think, you know, for a more senior position, if you're hiring for a CFO, I think you're going to want to meet that person. I think you're going to want them to meet with different people in the organization. You might want to be able to have a live face-to-face -face meeting or have them meet with members of the team. If you're hiring a ton of business development reps and very entry-level roles where you're constantly going to be hiring at a high volume for them, I think like video seems like a no brainer, right? To, to have that be the, the technique that you use to screen and get through those candidates. So I, I think it's going to, I think we're in for a, a totally different work and hiring experience as we come out of the pandemic. Yeah. And I think as these tools become more mainstream, it, it, companies are going to experiment with them. And, it, you know, as you say, they're going to figure out what, what's most appropriate for the level or type of position that they're hiring for. I think it's interesting, though, that, you know, you're going to see all these people potentially on, on video, on Zoom or some other platform, maybe in a webinar. Uh, and then six months later, you see them face to face for the first time. 
and you pass them in the hallway and, and you know them or you know a lot about them or you've heard them speak. You know, it's very, uh, it's a backwards way of meeting somebody, but it, I think we're going to see a lot of that uh, going forward. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah, I think it'll also kind of put a strain on, on HR and talent teams, quite honestly, because they're gonna have to be thinking about how to build that culture mm -hmm. and that employee experience in a remote environment. So, you know, it, it's an opportunity for a lot of creativity and rethinking the ways that we sort of build culture within work organizations, but it's, it's definitely a, a, a tough task, I think. Matt, I'm just curious, you know, as we come get past this pandemic and we start to get, you know, offices reopening and at least some of the people are going in there, how do you think it's going to play out? You know, like I said, you're going to, you're going to have recognize these people that you haven't met before, you know? Yeah, exactly right. I think that uh, is always right. I mean, the culture rebuild is something that we've had to really start thinking about as far as going back to the office. We talked a lot about culture and the life at the office and how it was the, a great place and a thriving organization. Then we had to change that when we went virtual. And now going back, it's going to be it's going to be a little bit of a culture shock. If we go to a hybrid model, some people are in the office, some people are out of the office. I've hired people on my own team I've never met ever. And uh, that was a that's a shock. Fascinating stuff uh, where this industry is going. And so quickly too. So um, let's move on to question four here. Each of you has a lot of firsthand experience with applicant tracking systems on either one side of the desk or the other, maybe even both. Um, any lessons learned, any stories or insights you wanna share with the audience? I know, you know people are probably, uh, hopefully there's a lot of HR um, managers, directors, maybe VPs out there. Maybe they have a system that they're not happy with. Maybe they feel like they haven't fully utilized it. Any insights you wanna pass along? Zoe, I see you nodding your head. You're up. <laughs> <laughs> well, clearly I'm biased <laughs> because <laughs> I, uh, I work for a company that is an ATS. Um, I think, you know, not to harp on, on the, the sort of video of it all, but the, the success story that I've seen where an ATS has really helped transform an organization early on in the pandemic, um, we were unfortunately or fortunately uh, planning to release a video interview tool uh, the release date was March 15th. So as you can imagine, lined right up with the, with the pandemic. Um, but we had a company that I, I believe we were their first ATS. They hadn't used the technology before and they were a, a healthy fast food chain, sort of like a drive-through concept. And mm -hmm. they did all of their hiring on sort of on-site events. So having like a ton of people in to do a live, uh, live interview and then they'd have quick conversations and, and hire staff. And that's how they would add staff to new um, locations and restaurants. So pretty quickly they had to go entirely remote. And that's where something like those video interviews where they could have quick 15 minute uh, conversations with candidates, see their personality, still retain some of that sort of in-person experience, um, but pivot really quickly across you know, a bunch of different locations um, in order to continue to staff up during, during the pandemic. That, to me, that was like the success story where I was like, oh, okay, this can work. This technology can actually help people um, transform their hiring, so. Huh. Mary, what do you think? Um, so for us in, in our system, it's um, a lot of keywords and um, the success that we have is really in, in keeping our candidate files up to date, um, especially within, you all know, within marketing and creative that um, your roles change all the time. And what you may call yourself today is not what you may be called six months, 12 months from now. So, um, the success story is more of um, you're keeping yourself current um, so that as you're doing fine in your position and you're passive, you'll be found by um, recru recruiters. Um, so I guess, you know, I, I'm not quite sure my success story is really ATS related as much as the human side of our keeping in touch with people so that what we have in our system is accurate as to who people are and who they say they are. Um, be, because as you're applying to things, if you call yourself one thing and it's not what it is today, 
you're not going to show up as as the most viable candidate. You know, I, I know you keep mentioning, you know, that you have staff doing some of the work live human interaction and part of it through an ATS system. So I think this hybrid model that you're discussing uh, is important uh, and it probably will be a part of this uh, technology uh, you know, for years going forward. I can't imagine, you know, as, as great as the technology is, it still needs a human um, uh, component. And actually, I'm starting to see some of the questions coming from our audience that are going to be interesting. So uh, just a reminder to the audience, you know, type in the window at any time in the chat window, any questions you might have, and we'll get to them. Um, let's see, where are we at time? Like 625, about another 10 minutes, we'll start taking your questions. Uh, Matt, are you still there? We lost I, your... Yeah, I lost my video. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you okay. We, yep. we have a static I don't know where my video went, but I, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> any, uh, any thoughts, any lessons learned, any stories yeah. you can share? I think that the biggest thing that I have taught the recruiting teams is that you could have a viable candidate in the ATS that's there and you're not finding that candidate because you're not sourcing from the ATS directly and you're not looking there first. Hmm. And what we started creating was talent pools of candidates uh, per based on the job, their industry and the job, marketing, finance, and so forth. And we've pooled the candidates, we've tagged them and put them into these pools. And we're able to go back and revisit these candidates that may or may not have fit a job at one particular time. And then they do fit one of the other roles that uh, we just opened up. So it was, you know, I think that's a very valuable tool. And now AI is starting to get involved with that particular type of tool. And you're able to go through your system and candidates are automatically being applied to different roles based on those talent pools. And I think that that's very important to know that some of these ATSs contain hundreds and hundreds of thousands of candidates. So it is better for the recruiting teams to check those systems first before going out and sourcing. How, how is that working specifically? Is the system, the ATS, you know, uh, telling you here are the top three candidates over here, but here are these other five you may want to look at down the road or something or just silver curious? Med they, they, they're, they're really titling like silver medalist, gold medalist, bronze medalist, uh -huh. gold. and they're with the tags that you set up accordingly and you're able to group those candidates in these pools, they're able to be extracted from the pools and assigned to certain jobs that are open. And it's really some unique technology. I like it. So you didn't get the job. You got a gold. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Um, question five. We seem to be relegating more and more of the hiring process to artificial intelligence. It's never going to be 100%, but it's certainly more than we have before. So what does that mean for the future going forward? How's it changing the hiring and recruiting process? And uh, let's start with Zoe, since you're, uh, you're the one bringing us all this great technology. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, we've talked a little bit about um, the ways in which I think AI is going to help source specifically. And I think, Matt, like your example is a great one, right? Like if we could apply some of that AI technology to actually rank candidates that you've already spoken to that are already interested in your company, that's just going to make us uh, even more efficient and find even more qualified candidates. I think one thing we haven't talked about yet today, but I also think is important to think about is how can this technology help with diversity, equity, and inclusion, mm -hmm. which is something I know a lot of hiring teams and organizations are really focused on at the moment. So I think, you know, you're never going to be able to have an equitable recruiting process because you have a tool to do it. You have to be committed to that and the organization has to be committed to doing that. But uh, are there ways in which we can use this technology to more directly address some of those issues? I think there are. So I think, you know, how is it changing the recruiting process and where is it going? I think that's another important piece of the technology. What's, I'm curious to hear from Matt and uh, Mary on uh, the learning curve when you're using an ATS. Is it, uh, does it take a long time? Is it fairly intuitive? And do you find yourself, if you're looking for a new recruiter, hoping to find one that's used your particular ATS, you know, or not? Does it make a difference? Yeah, I I think that to find a recruiter that has experience with a particular ATS is essential, but not always. I mean, I think if I, I've used many ATSs where I've gone to organizations where I've never touched their ATS and I've fell right in and got the experience right away. So they're similar in a lot of the ways to use them, but that there is a learning curve essentially for disposition and candidates with systems and so forth and sending resumes to managers. But I would say it's not much. You can get a good recruiter onto an ATS in, in a day's time. 
Well, that's good. That's good to hear. Mary, yeah, they're pretty intuitive. They're pretty intuitive. Hmm. Um, you know, the one that we do does take you through the, the hiring journey. Um, but for us, it's really how we extrapolate candidates for specific roles that are, that's key for us. Um, but there's the whole, I mean, we've got tens of thousands of candidates in our database. And for us to go through, for all the different companies we're working for, we're matching up not only their skills, but also their personalities mm -hmm. based upon what we're told about the culture of a company. Um, so it's based upon our pre-screening candidates and having ongoing conversations and remembering as many people as we can. Now, luckily this system helps us remember those conversations because we track them. Um, but we're not just looking for one brand. We're not just looking for one culture, um, which, you know, having these systems really helps us be able to do a better match than we would otherwise. Definitely. Zoe, how difficult is it for a company, company X to migrate from say one ATS system to, to, to yours into a different system? I'm sure you factor that into your product design, I would think. Oh yeah, you have to, because the other thing is, I think um, in this field, people are always looking for sort of the best technology to keep things fresh and, and, and innovative, right? So you, you have to make it easy for them to come into your system. Um, it's such, a, it can be a disruptive process to implement an ATS because you're migrating a ton of really sensitive data. Um, you also have to get buy-in from some of your hiring managers. And so if you've got this lengthy implementation that takes three months or six months, um, you're going to lose some of that trust with those folks in the organization. You don't want to do that. So I think, I think actually the technology has gotten much better just across the entire field. It's pretty easy now to migrate data in. It's more about what kind of onboarding experience do you want? Do you want more of a self-guided experience? Do you want you know, a dedicated account manager and, and customer service, uh, customer success type of plan? Um, but you know, it has to be seamless because people expect it to work like all of their other technology solutions in the workplace do. And you need to be able to log in and immediately, uh, you can't have a disruption in hiring just because you're switching your ATS. No, I, I, I have no idea. So I'm curious if you, you know, um... How, what what is the uh, uh, installation and onboarding of, a, of an ATS? Does it take uh, you know days, weeks? Um, just any, any any reference point? I'd I'd be curious to hear what Matt's experience has been. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you probably have to do this a bunch. <laughs> I have I have spent countless hours putting <laughs> ATSs in place, and <laughs> the worst case scenario is if you're going from one ATS to another. That is a very tedious task, but mm. putting one in from scratch, that's a little bit easier. It is still about the data. It is still about the metrics and measuring that. And I think it's all about the features you're going to want and how it's interfacing with, say, an HRIS system, the human resources system, how that interfaces. I've been in places where there's standalone ATSs, and then I've been in places where they want the ATS to talk to the HR system. And that is a little bit more of a tedious task to set that up. But yeah, it, it is countless. It is it's longer hours. Interesting. Mary, have you uh, used the same system all along or? No, I've been through two transitions. Um, and one was, uh, one was a very long time ago and we ended up going back to the system we were at. We were a beta site. Mm. Um, and then most recently we went from, um, a, a fairly small system to a, a, a more robust system that gave us a lot more information, um, a lot more ways of tracking people. Um, so it was like an add-on. And I would say when we did that, it took about a week oh, okay. to transition over. Um, and then, you know, you have to go in and do some file cleanup, but it, it, it was fairly seamless and it was so well worth it. All right, let's move along to question six. This is my favorite photo. But these people look excited about applying for a job. <laughs> uh, there is some sentiment that ATS technology makes it harder for candidates to connect with employers for a variety of reasons. They're now just one resume in a pile of thousands. 
Uh, there's no way to get around the system anymore, at least less ways. And you have some homogenization of resumes, right? People are being told that it has to be set up in a certain way. Don't use crazy fonts. Don't use shading. Don't use columns so that it scans correctly. What are, what are your thoughts um, on, is it harder for candidates because of the technology or it, you know, I guess it's what side you're looking at it from too. Like from the, from when we start with the, from Zoe on the employer side, you know, what do you, what do you think? You know, I think a good ATS should make it easier for you to connect with candidates. And I, I think part of this is like the technology is only as good as the, the system that you're implementing it within. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have that personal connection with candidates, you know, you can make the technology work with you to do that, but that you have to sort of commit to that process. I think like to me, the, the best example of this is disqualification uh, emails. Once you've disqualified a candidate, are you reaching out to them to let them know, hey, you're no longer part of the process and thank you so much for your time. And uh, how timely is that follow up and response? How personalized is it? Are you providing them with feedback in that email? I mean, you know, the system can help you do that in a fairly efficient manner. But if that communication isn't thoughtful and personalized, if the timing is, you know, if it's weeks later after they've had their most recent interview or it's five minutes after they walk out the door, you know, that's gonna make it hard for you to connect with that candidate in a meaningful way. So I personally think that a good ATS should help you to do this, but a lot of it is your own system and how your hiring process is set up and whether it's set up to actually create these really good meaningful interactions with candidates. Yeah, we talked a little bit about this during the, the rehearsal last week. Um, mm -hmm. This is kind of a whole nother avenue of communication that companies don't really think about. Those emails that go out to let people know you're, you know, thanks for applying or you got the job or, you know, how they're written, what they say, they're conveying a lot about the company's culture. And uh, I, I wonder if, you know, in the future, you know, will that, will marketing get more involved in these ATS systems? I don't know, you know, but it's uh, it's it's an avenue of communication. So I, I find it fascinating. Matt, what do you think? I think that uh, what I've always trained recruiting teams on is that the personalization that is taken away from ATS systems by just sending out template emails or like Zoe was mentioning, the rejection emails that are declining a candidate that aren't necessarily as personalized as they could be. I mean, we've gotten away from picking up the phone and declining a candidate uh, you know, one on one after they've gone through an interview process. I think I've always preached to hiring teams and to the recruiters that they have to keep that personal touch to keep the candidate experience intact. And I think that the ATS at times can take away from that by creating these template emails and just a less human touch to it. So I, I do think that at some point, the resumes do get lost inside ATSs. There is a black hole, like candidates do say, with ATSs, and, and the personalization gets taken away sometimes. So I think a good ATS will keep that personalized, uh, uh, you know, that process intact. Mm. Yeah, and, I, you know, it, it has to do with the candidate experience and the commitment a company has towards that candidate experience. We hear all the time the, 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 the downside and the, I never hear anything back. And one of the things that we suggest to people, again, is you got to work with the system because it's there, but can you find someone in the company that can help champion or advocate for you uh, to support you in your pursuit of that position um, so that there is a human person if you're not hearing from HR? Um, again, it's the, the, the people part of it. Um, I think Matt's point spot on as far as, you know, there are black holes and, uh, you know, it's the company's responsibility to look at that candidate experience. We are right on time, by the way. So I'm going to uh, skip question seven for the moment and go right into uh, questions from the audience because we do have about 20 minutes left and they've been listening. They have some specifics. Let's see, um, what is a reasonable amount of effort a candidate should be expected to perform for an interview, i.e. a sample of how you would work on one of their projects? That's an interesting one. Does ATS get involved in that? You know, actually having them go through a test of some sort or, uh, uh, to, for specific positions? I think it, it can, yeah, it can. I mean, it, again, I, I think it really depends on the role for a more technical role. Like if you're hiring um, 
a coder uh, or a backend developer and you want to make sure that they have a, a specific technical skill set because it's really pertinent to the role, you might have some sort of coding assignment. Um, even for, for roles on my team, we have a, a writing assignment that we ask candidates to do. It shouldn't take them more than half an hour, but the idea is just to get a sense for, you know, their, their writing acumen and, and um, make sure that they understand some of the, the basic skills and requirements for, for the role. I think that's fair. I think the, the more uh, technical, the more skilled, the more senior the role, the, the more effort you can expect to, to have during the interview process. And, and like the more, the different types of tools that you might use, um, those can come through the ATS, but those can also just be part of the in-person or face-to-face -face interview process. Mm. I don't think it necessarily has to be within the system. Yeah, you, you get into senior candidates presenting to a team where they're given an assignment and then they share their thoughts or ideas so that um, hiring managers can get a sense of problem solving and someone's thinking and what it would be like to actually work with them. Yeah, Matt, I think you forwarded me uh, an article the other day that I was looking at and yep. it was uh, almost a psychological test that they yeah. had you going through to, to assess your IQ and problem solving abilities. The kind logic, of scary. Yeah, the logic tests or the aptitude tests uh, and the also, also the multiple, you know, the multiple choice uh, personality tests. Right. Uh, those are all being built in mm -hmm. to ATSs that I've seen and they're being used at all levels. I, I am seeing them not just at the senior levels, but at some companies, the more mid-level positions. And I think it's very interesting how they're doing that. Yeah, and some companies some companies use those those personality tests before they actually even speak with people. Right. Yes. You know, it, it, it's sort of yeah. you know is this a culture match? And they're they're assessing very wide concepts like curiosity and some bigger ideas. I got to tell you though, on the, on the receiving end though, if you if you you don't you know, pass the thing, you feel like you flunked. <laughs> I don't even get to, I don't even get to go forward anymore. Are you kidding? No. Well, you want to you want to know why? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. There's um I think it's Red Bull that one of their assessments is a personality assessment, but the way they position it to candidates through their website on the careers page is we're trying to figure out how best to fit you in with the team. So it's less about oh is it pass fail and how did you do <laughs> and, and will you get the job. And more about, okay, you're an extrovert. So let's figure out how this team environment should actually work with that skill set. Or yeah. you're an introvert. So you'll need, you want your manager to approach you in this particular way instead of that way. So I think there's other ways to position some of this work too, so that it feels less like homework or less like a, a pass fail test for the candidate and more about creating an engaging work experience for them once they've joined the organization. Yeah, and again, it, it's it's what gets put into the tool by the people who are assessing it and making sure that it's in alignment with what they're trying to find from it. Um, I think these tools have gone a long way and people um, are being coached on the HR side on how to use them better than they have in, in years past. Because before it was just a blanket thing to use. Um, I think that there's the explanation process that has to go along with it, though. Like when I've been in these organizations that do administer these, you know, there's personality indexes or predictive indexes yeah. or these logic tests. There's an element of explaining why the candidate has to go through it. And then also, like we were saying, the results of why, if you did not pass, how that fits into the hiring process. The cutting off of the candidate because they didn't pass and never hearing from them again is the most, uh, you know, the, I, that, that has to turn off hundreds of candidates from the organization. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think it crushes some people, you know, emotionally. Yeah, it's like, oh, yeah. gosh, you know? um, let's see another question from the audience here. This is a good one. Some employers are now using a multiple choice aptitude test for more senior positions. Many of us do not do well on this type of test, and many just drop out immediately. Any suggestions on how a candidate should handle that? Yeah, I think that candidate, the, the, we were saying the candidate experience from that, I mean, it's, it is crushing. You don't know how to, there is no right or wrong or how to pass that type of test. 
Um, it is being assessed for certain positions and they're doing a, a back end type of correction on that and looking for certain pieces in there that really are unknown. And I think that that is, I, I don't, I, I sometimes as a candidate, I fail to see how that aligns with the particular roles that I'm applying to. And that's where I think the candidate experience is the misstep in that company. You know, they're not explaining it. It's, it's, there's the, the logic piece is, it's, it's just a failure. And, and I really feel like uh, these, these companies are missing out on that element. Mm. Mary or Zoe, any thoughts on this? I one? mean, a, a, again, it, 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 you know, to, to complement what Matt's saying, it has to make sense for what the company's trying to achieve and using a tool like that. Um, you know, sometimes it's the new shiny coin and you got to mm. use it. Uh, there was a follow-up question that came up. How long are the results of those tests staying in the system? And I assume they're wondering because, you know, what if they want to apply for another job with that company? Is that test yeah. now in the system? Is it going to hang around for a year or do I get to try it again for a different role? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that, that those probably do stay in the system. Mm. Um, I know I was uh, applying for a role that was with a, venture capital backed company and the company was using the assessment because the VC said you have to use this assessment mm. and their yeah. hiring was done across the board for all the VC backed companies that that VC backed you know that put their money into and they said we do this for all of our companies so I believe that that probably stays in the system for a, a while. Yeah, I think I think those types of results will. I, I think again, like the the hope is that if you're applying for a position for six months, a year after the last time you've applied to that organization, there's enough of a change in your candidate profile that that's not the first thing that's going to come up. It's going to be more about the the stage that you got to, what you've done in terms of your experience in between that first application and that next application. Um, like I think Matt talked about this before, but if you have a recruitment team that's actively sourcing within, you know, the past candidates that they've spoken to, that test, I don't believe, is going to necessarily disqualify you from moving forward to a different role, particularly if it's a different role with a different team or a slightly different um, set of objectives. You're going to have to go through that process again, but, it, you know, it shouldn't hold you back from, from applying for that new role. I'm just curious, what, what do ATS systems do if the same candidate uh, comes back three, four times, you know, over a six month period, let's say, or a year applying for the same role, you know, does it, does it recognize that person? Does it take it I in think, again or? I, um, my experience is it depends on the company and their hiring um, uh, guidelines. And this is, as an outside recruiter, some companies are there, their assessment of candidates is, is decentralized so that a candidate could apply for a similar role several times during a year and it doesn't get flagged necessarily because mm -hmm. each role is considered its own set of candidates. So it won't yeah. get, that exactly. person already applied five times. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. And you could put notes in the system for each candidate. There is a note section uh, where there are notes that a recruiter could write down about that particular candidate. But yeah. Mary's exactly right. The, the candidates are attached individually to those uh, jobs. Right. I, I think typically, too, like in our system, it will tell you, oh, can, this candidate has applied for a few other roles um, so that it's flagged. If, if you happen to uh, apply to two or three roles at once, two or three similar roles, um, you'll be at, at least the recruiter in the system will be able to see, oh, okay, this person is advanced to the interview stage in this pipeline and they're at the screening stage in this pipeline. So at least you're not in a situation where you're getting two different offers from two different teams at the same company. Um, usually they're, yeah, usually they're- I, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> And it is problem to have. <laughs> it isn't. And it, 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 to to emphasize this, it's not a negative to have it be stated that someone's applied multiple times. No, um, I think I would think the company would benefit from knowing that. A, they're seeing a, you know, a high degree of interest in this candidate and working for exactly. this company. 
the and camera. seeing that, hey, there's, there's, maybe there's three or four different ways this person could fit here. Yeah, and sometimes yeah. I see managers sharing resumes too, where they're like, hey, you know, I've uh, these are people I spoke with. Um, so there's sharing that goes on too. So, so yeah, since I have two recruiters on the line, I have to ask this question. You know, you always they're always told in these automated responses that they're going to keep your resume on file, and if anything yep. else opens up, they might reach back out to you. Does that ever happen? Yep. I don't know whether that's it ever. Does. Happened, yep. Uh, yeah. Does it really? It yeah. happened today. It happened yeah. today. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's good. It's good to yep. know that the possibilities are still out there. Well, like I said, going back to the sourcing in your own system, uh, if you do pool those candidates the right way and you do tag them the right way, then you can always revisit those candidates. And we have marketing campaign software built into these ATSs that actually can go out and email the candidates that we have in these pools and say, hey, you know, we're still hiring over here. We have some upcoming positions. Would you be interested? Do ATS systems uh, monitor the regularity of communication? You know, when candidates, the complaint you're often hear from candidates is, I applied, I talked to a couple, you know, I, I talked to them initially and uh, they, they, they said they were going to set up an interview and then poof, they're gone. I never hear from them again. Perfect. Does does the system kind of keep track so that at least the, the HR team knows, oh, wow, this man, we, we probably should respond to this person, you know? Yeah, most ATSs, well, many of the ATSs that I, I've seen will have that built in. So you'll be able to see like other candidates that are slipping away that I haven't reached out to. Is there a to-do list based on candidates in a specific job stage? Um, did I leave someone hanging? Do I have an interview coming up? Have I sent the, the email I was meant to send? So I think there are various layers of reminders and um all of that communication is centralized within the system. So in theory, you know, you can go into any job and understand what communication you've had with each candidate in that specific pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. But it's about the training of the recruiters too. Like I've said that training the recruiters to be able to educating them on how to use the system, the data integrity involved in that system to make sure that the candidates are moved accordingly throughout the process and that they're not sitting in one status in, for one length of time, uh, that's important as well. Mm -hmm. Got a great question here. Um, it has to do with salary, which is always a very touchy subject. Uh, job seekers are reluctant to put in their salary as a numeric. However, some ATS systems uh, do not allow you to put in text. So I think they're, they're kind of getting at, what are you supposed to do? I mean, do you want a range? Do you want a number? Do you want... A, you know, a, a narrative description of how much you're worth. <laughs> you know, there's a, a lot of possibilities there, and 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 this person's right. You know, it's different almost on every system I've seen. Mm. Zoe, how does how does your system handle, for example, like salary? Does that come up in a? Are they asked about salary up front? It can. It really depends on the organization. Yeah. So, um, you you know, most ATSs will allow you to customize the application form so that you can decide. Uh, what exactly, what information is required, what format it's required in. Um, you know, I think for, on the employer side, um, when you're posting jobs, sometimes on the job boards, they'll ask you for a specific salary range. And, and so that's why you might include that information on the application form so that you can get um, in front of the right set of candidates. But, you know, I think that comes down to the actual uh, company itself making that decision. You know, it's gonna help you sometimes, other times, it can be a deterrent, I think, for candidates who are applying. Mm -hmm. I, I would think that uh, for the better recruiters, you know, if they're seeing something in you as a candidate, that even if you're not perfect for that position, and, and let's say you're a little bit over the salary range, I've had this happen to me. Well, they'll, they'll just call and have a conversation anyway, and they'll just be very honest about what the salary range is. And that's okay. I mean, that's yeah. personally, I'd rather... I'd rather have yeah. it at bat for that than not at all. You know? That's exactly right. I think that the recruiters will have that uh, narrative and the dialogue with the candidate to find out more about their salary, if there's any flexibility on it. And I'm not paying attention as close uh, as I did maybe 10 years ago to salaries now, because I know that there could be some room and there could be some movement on candidate salaries in this type of job market. So you definitely do want to call and, and find out about that. We're uh, winding down for the last couple of minutes. Uh, diversity came up in the in the uh, question window. How do uh, how do uh, these ATS systems help companies to um, adhere to their diversity uh, policies? 
maybe you can start Zoe that, that that's kind of I would think a big one that's plugged into your system right yeah, yeah it's incredibly important I mean again I, you know I still think you have to be committed to it as an organization having a tool pressing a button somewhere it's not going to it's not going to magically make the organization more diverse or more inclusive so it it starts with executive buy-in it starts with accountability and I think a big piece of that is measurement measuring the right data um, I think that's a you know it becomes this gap where you don't even know how your company is performing relative to certain DEI initiatives because you just don't have that data. So I think that's that's key, having a system that will allow you to track how you're doing across the hiring pipeline so you can identify those gaps. So if you say we're, we're seeing major drop off or we're only seeing a specific type of candidate or the sources that we're getting candidates from are primarily men or primarily this, that, or the other, you need to be able to track that so you can do something about it. I, I do think the technology is also getting to a place where you can start to do even more. So things like anonymizing names and um, phone numbers and birthdays on a resume, for example, so that when you first get that batch of resumes in, all you're looking at is experience. You're not seeing the name, you're not seeing the age, you're trying to uh, scramble some of that data so that you can try and mitigate some of that unconscious bias that we might have at the beginning of the pipeline. And then I think the final piece um, of how systems can help with this and why it's important, I think it's also finding really diverse sources, finding more diverse candidates. Some of that's just gonna be, uh, I think Matt, you were talking about this earlier. Some of this is just uh, finding passive candidates, going out and sourcing candidates that are the right fit, that didn't come to your website or didn't apply through the free job boards. Um, some of it's finding other creative ways to find those candidates and fill the pipeline, because if you're, posting a job in one place and you're just getting the same type of candidate over and over again, you have to change up the, the method. You have to go and, and seek out those candidates. I'm going to want to sneak in one more question. We've got about uh, four minutes to go here. Um, this came up in the uh, chat room as well. Are recruiters comments that are entered into the ATS shared with other companies or are they kept internal to the company that the candidate applied to? No, those are very, very strict on those, the privacy and, Matter of fact, we're very uh, careful with those comments because we, and, you know, with public companies, we get audited on our ATS and comments are looked at. So we have to be very careful on what we're putting in the comments. And those are never released to anyone outside the hiring process. I'd love to see those comments. Like, I, you know, a good candidate didn't like his tie or... <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got about three minutes to go. So let me, uh, well, first let me get back to my screen here. I have too many screens going, guys. Uh, there we go. Um, so just some closing items. I just wanted to give a very special thank you to today's panelists, Mary Truslow, Matt Liptak, and Zoe Moore. It's been a wonderful conversation. I think there's some great points that were covered. Um, and I think we could talk about this for another two hours easily. I mean, it's just, it's a very complex technology, it's a growing technology, uh, and it's not, going, it's not going away. And, and I was particularly fascinated with Mary's discussion about how you still have to have this you know, humane, this humanity attached. It can't all be uh, a simple automated system where you press the button and it goes and finds the best candidates. I uh, also wanted to say thanks to our audience. I know you had a lot of choices about where to be this afternoon, and we you know, greatly appreciate your spending the time with the AMA Boston. We hope these types of programs you know, give you some uh, food for thought. Uh, we will be sending out an email to everybody who's registered with a recording, a link to a recording of this event. And we're also going to email everybody a link to a survey. We'd love to hear from you on the survey about how we, you know, how, how did we do? Any suggestions you have for the future? Maybe you have some topics you'd like to see us, you know, cover yourself. That would be great. Um, in terms of upcoming events, and I'm going to ask Megan to come back and with me here. Um, we have an AMA Boston Marketing Mingle. So, um, you yeah, know, we're the AMA Boston. If you'd like to come and get to know us a little bit better. On March 11th, which is a Thursday evening from 6 to 7, uh, this is another virtual event. It's featuring David Meiselman, the CMO at Easy Cater. Um, so he looks like a jovial gentleman, so I'm sure it'll be a, a great discussion. Meg, do you want to add any, any two cents here? We've got about one minute to go. Well, I think you covered it. Thanks again, everyone, for coming tonight. And we hope to see you in, in March at our Marketing Mingle. It'll be a fun opportunity to meet a local CMO who's done some interesting work over the last year um, and get to talk with him live. So take care and thanks to our panelists again for coming out tonight and uh, be well, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you so much.